I don't include it gets people offended. Special opening, and uh, then we'll uh, get started. So hello and Hit welcome. Hit record is better than hitting me. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, thanks for posting where you are joining us from. Looks like hey, we Vicky have- Coke is here, who I just mentioned. Look at that. Yep, from Springfield. From all hey. the world. We bow to the Springfield people. You ever see Illinois Springfield? Sorry, I'm Sarah. That's okay. That's okay. I'm going to have to you. <laughs> uh, Thank you, everyone, for taking time out of your day to join us. On behalf of Contact North, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the webinar, How Faculty Can Harness Generative AI for Enhanced Learning. My name is Sarah Govro. I'm the director of Teach Online and the Online Learning News at Contact North, and I'll be hosting the session today. So before we begin, I'd just like to start off with our provincial land acknowledgement, respectfully acknowledging that Contact North's work and the work of our community partners takes place on traditional indigenous territories across the province. We are grateful to be able to work and live in these territories. We are thankful to the First Nations, Métis and Inuit people who have cared for these territories since time immemorial and who continue to strengthen Ontario and all communities across the province. So uh, before I hand it over to Kurt, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, the chat is open. Just remember to select everyone on the pull down menu. Um, but if you do have any questions, please enter them into the Q&A tool um, and uh, we will address those at the end of the session. Uh, there's also the upvote uh, function. So if there's a question in there that really resonates with you, if you hit the little thumbs up icon, uh, that will bring it up to the top of the queue. Um, I also have live captioning. I'm going to start that there. Um, uh, so you be able should be able to see that on your screen. If not, um, just look at the, the captioning uh, tool at the bottom and just click on that and you should be able to see that. Um, once the webinar is finished, I will post the recording as well as the slides, teachonline.ca, and I'll put that um, link in the chat momentarily. Um, all right, that's it for me. On to the main event. I know Kurt is chomping at the bit to get going here, so it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Curtis J. Bonk, professor at the School of Education and adjunct professor at the School of Informatics at Indiana University. Welcome, Curtis. Thank you so much for joining us. Hello to all my friends. Hello to Sarah. Sarah, do you realize, Sarah, stay on your screen. Do you realize we've got more than 50%? We're up to 152 people. And what was it, 286 signed up? Maybe more than that, but more than 50%. Man, it's growing, it's growing, it's growing. We got people yeah. here from Finland. My friend Mark Kircher from Finland, fr friend Mark Drun, uh, uh, John Drun from Canada. We got UK, China, Germany, India, Indonesia, Pakistan, Philippines, Portugal. Porto, Portugal, Uganda, South Africa, Australia, Argentina, USA, New Zealand, if they didn't say it, and just on the chat window we see, we've got Istanbul, Turkey with us. I need to go to Istanbul maybe next year. I keep missing out on that chance. Thank you, and thank you all for coming in, including my, some of my students like Rachel. Um, this is the first time I'm giving this talk. I've given talks to teachers in Japan a couple of months ago and how to, uh, English teachers, language learning teachers. So I have many language learning examples, but many more than that in this talk. So this is gonna be a dry run through this. There'll be part two on February 8th at 10 a.m. Eastern time, that's a Thursday. So if you like this one, stop in for part two. If you didn't like it, ah, don't bother. <laughs> um, I have been dabbling in pedagogy for a few decades, and I do have a free book that I'll mention at the end. You can download, you can download now at techvariety.com, but it's written before this age of AI. So we maybe need to write another book of with a hundred different ideas in it or not, because I'm gonna show you a few that already exist from others, some free resources that you can tap into. So this talk will be framed within my two pedagogical frameworks, some people know it as the R2-D2 model, read, reflect, display, and do. Read, reflect, display, and do, which is in one book of 100 ideas and another book of 100 ideas with my tech variety framework for motivation. So we'll frame this from the standpoint of psychology. Um, and we're gonna have a couple polling questions to start with us. Hang on a second, let me call up my slides. And you can download my slides. They'll, they'll be at the website after the recording goes up. These slides will exist for you to all tap into if you want to. Um, but um, Sarah, 
we'll make these available along with the recording. They're also at trainingshare.com. So if you type, go into trainingshare.com, one word, you can download the slides. Uh, we're gonna have a couple different polling questions popped up here at the beginning. Sarah, you wanna go into number one? We'll jump in and I don't see the first, there it go. So polling question number one, have you, you use ChatGPT or generative AI for any teaching, training, tutoring, translating, all the T words out there. You know, John like, likes these iterations, all the T words. So far, so good. We're at, wow, quite a few of you filling these out quite fast. Great. Sarah, you want to reveal the results here? We're at 67% have used it. So I'm speaking to the choir here, right? So, um, so yeah, thanks. And the second question, we can get uh, as well, Sarah. I don't know if we've shared the results, but 67%. Um, Sarah, the next question, polling question two. Hold on here, it's... Uh... It's giving it's you a hard time, time. okay. Doing some wonky things here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, hold on. Well, I... There we go. I want to stop sharing. There we go. That's why. There we go. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> Polling question number two. Have you used ChatGPT or generative AI for any of your formal informal learning? So learning as opposed to teaching, training, or tutoring, or translating. And so far, we've got a heavy body of users. So we've got Again, people who are a little bit knowledgeable, a little bit familiar, some people quite savvy, many people know more than I do out there. And so we can end the poll now and share the results with everyone. Um, so we're at 69, so about the same percentage of users and of um, uh, teachers in this interesting AI world. Now what I'd like you to try and do in the chat window, I want you to put a number for how many ideas you have related to pedagogy with AI. How many strategies do you have that maybe you've tried out or you thought about? If it's zero, put zero. If it's one, put one. How many strategies, if it's 10, if it's 15, how many strategies do you already know or you have utilized or thought, even thought about, not even utilized yet? I'm just curious how many, you know, how, how many ideas you already have? Three, four, five. Thank you. Okay. Chin Fen, two to three. Okay. Sophie's got two. Agnes has none. Agnes, I hope we can work on that this hour. Okay. Millie, good to have you here from China. Three ideas. All right. Okay. All right. So now you some of you have so many ideas. Oh, Chris, Kristen, one of my students has one idea, maybe from my class. I want you to put um, type out maybe five to 10 words, what that one idea is or what, what your favorite idea is for utilizing AI in education. What's something you could share with everybody here in this webinar, all 150 some, 169 people now, Sarah. Okay, we've got one more, we get 170. So all these people wanna learn something. Why don't you help them learn by typing in what you're doing? Research, content creation, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Critiques, okay. Creating summaries, all that. That's what I'm using in my two different classrooms this fall. Okay, I'm having be brave options of utilizing ChatGPT. I call it be brave, be courageous out there. Content research, Vicky. Thank you. Oh, practicing your quizzes, Rachel. You practicing for your qualifying exam, Rachel. Okay, I see. Uh, authentic assessments, Yolandi. Okay, John. Supporting conversation, Mike, Alicia. Content analysis, right? Oh, right. We'll talk about that at lunch tomorrow. Okay, I'm going to stop my chat and move on to the next part of this session. So, uh, oh, we have a third question, Sarah. Why don't you pop this one up? How often do you utilize ChatGPT and other generative AI tools? So here we go. How often? Gobs of times each day, nearly every day, about once a week, once a month, just once or twice to test it out. Okay. Some gobs of time, <laughs> gobs and gobs of time, or nothing, <laughs> or nothing. Okay, all right. So there is a bottom answer down there. Never, 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 Neverland, the Neverland. Okay, all right. So well, nearly every day, one in five, almost more than that, 
more than one to five, nearly every day. Okay. Once a week, at least a quarter of you, almost a third of you once a week. So I'm going to end this poll and we'll share the results with everyone out there. As you can see, gobs of time, 8% of you, gobs of time. <laughs> Uh, on my screen, I can't see the never, never, never. 12%, 12, 1 in 10, 1 in 9 of you haven't used it. So maybe we can get you on your way, get you started, get you thinking about it. Okay. All right. I'm going to stop the sharing there and we'll close that out. We'll have a couple more polling questions at the end. AI is in the news all the time. AI, 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 whether it's K-12, whether it's corporate training and here, higher education, right? We're hearing about people utilizing it people banning it, people rushing to think about it and read about it and so forth. We're also reading about AI, AI, yeah, because the guy in charge of chat GP is being fired, not fired, being refired, being rehired. It's kind of confusing out there today. That's not a space I would like to be in. So I'd get a little nervous if I was in charge of a company like that today. We're also having a lot of special issues, a lot of attention being paid to ChatGPT. I think I've got four research articles, two have been published. I'll share that. You can go to Publication Share, my homepage, and read my articles on utilizing ChatGPT to teach languages. Three of my articles are in special issues or in being reviewed in special issues. There must be, it must be at least 50 special issues on ChatGPT and, and special articles like the Chronicle of Higher Education here. You know, how will AI change higher ed? <laughs> Don't believe the hype. Optimistic view. AI can enhance the pleasures of learning. We're all asking the wrong questions, Dana Boyd and others. You know, it's confusing mess out there. Yet nature tells us last week, nature, nature, why teachers should explore ChatGPT's potential, including highlighting one of my former students, Ron Baghetto from Arizona State. I'll come to that later on. A recent study, Flower, Flower Darby, Love that name from the Chronicle of Higher Education found that 49%, 50% basically, of college students are using it, but less than half that amount of faculty members are. There's a disconnect between students and faculty. And if you read on that article from Flower Darby, you can hear what Malabali does, my good friend at American University in Cairo. And as you can see from the pictures there, I was visiting her two months ago in Cairo, Egypt. She has her students, and I actually visited her class and chatted with her students and, and presented to her students, um, undergraduates there. She encourages them to use AI to generate ideas, refine their first drafts, even start an assignment with ChatGPT draft, and then turn it into something that they own. Now, how much is that different from the old days of Wikipedia and other resources that students would find that will supplement their learning, getting started, starter text in effect? We all start with starter text. And you can read that article from Flower Darby, click on the video where Mali, Mahabali explains what she's doing there. I like this quote from Middlebury State University, or Middlebury College, I should say now. What's the harm for students who opt to cheat by using AI to write papers and passing the class? Asked J Jason Mattel, film professor and media culture professor at, of American Studies at Middlebury College. After 23 years, 23 years of teaching, I've been here 32 years, a little longer than he was there. I've, I've come to realize that my job is neither to police students who don't want to learn nor to rank them via grades, but to maximize the learning for those students who want to learn, to try and inspire those others to join in that learning quest. So the focus is on motivation, which is today's focus as well. How to inspire, how to, how to foster passion, volition, intrinsic motivation, and so forth. You know, we got ChatGPT telling us that OpenAI is exploring, exploring. We're going to explore how to get into classrooms. Just explore. <laughs> uh, you know, last week, this is in Reuters. They're going to explore. You think, you think explore? You think it might have a chance to work in education? Just, just maybe? Just maybe we're going to explore this new thing called teaching and learning with ChatGPT. <laughs> I had a laugh when I looked at the title of this article. There's a lot going on. No need to explore. We need to share what, what we're doing in the window, chat window with everyone else in here. If you think of other ideas that you're utilizing ChatGPT for or generative AI, chat PDF and other tools, put them in the chat window. You can read about things in OpenAI's blog, Teaching with AI. And I've got a couple examples from that. So if you download the slides, you can click on all these links and access these resources. So this talk is based on this resource 
as well as this resource from the US Department of Ed, AI, as well as this resource heavily used, Alicia and Lena, this is the International Association of Language Learning. I know you're English professors, a wonderful free resource called Free Language Technology Magazine, FLT Mag. I didn't know anything about this until a month ago when I spoke on AI for English teachers. And what a marvelous resource this is. I got idea after idea after idea. I couldn't, couldn't turn my computer off, literally, honestly. So I've got some ideas from there. You can also go to UNESCO's re report, Quick Start Guide to ChatGPT and AI in Higher Education, to look at how AI can be a collaboration coach. AI helps students research and solve problems and collaborate together. AI is a personal tutor that gives them progress reports and feedback. AI as a Socratic opponent, which a lot of people are using it for today, a debate coach, or a guide on the side, of course, that generates questions and, and ideas and advices, and then a Socratic opponent, right? Many different, now, this is probably the number one blog out there that I've heard about, Elon Malik's uh, an associate professor at UPenn, associate professor of management. And he has one of his blog posts as one, it's called the One Useful Ling, Thing blog, <laughs> assigning AI seven ways that it can help. It can be a teammate who poses alternative points of view, right? It can be a coach offering reflection questions and metacognitive prompts and aids. It can be a mentor giving you feedback on your improvement and advice on how to con continue to improve. It can be a simulator giving you practice exam scenarios and cases. It can be a tool to help you accomplish a little additional information by being an augmentative aid, a simulator to help you apply the knowledge that you have, application questions and so forth. If you can go to Daniel Stanford's Substack, which is a wonderful website. I got like 10 ideas for this talk today from going to this website. He talks about utilizing AI for creative writing and brainstorming, role play, Research, which many of you had in there in the chat window, research ideas, presentation ideas and presentation prep, and even instructional design, which is my department. He had a few ideas for that at the end. Um, revising texts, of course, generating content, of course, and intentional misuse, right? And then you go on to Seb Dianati and Suman Ludari from Charles Darwin University down there in Australia. Um, they talk about 25 different applications of AI that they've come up with, including providing YouTube summaries and having questions spin off of them um, that you can utilize when you're showing a YouTube video or other types of videos, creating rubrics for assessment purposes, at least scratching them out and having you revise those rubrics, sparking debates, as we already mentioned, um, and having discussion prompts, which is one of the ways in which I've utilized ChatGPT, creating discussion prompts in the forums and so forth. Um, and you can read uh, the whole article. It's quite interesting. This article, or this book, actually was one that inspired me. And I've got 10, 15 ideas from quickly. I only got halfway through the book. So it's called Text Gen Ed, an introduction to teaching with text generation technologies. They had different professors um, from around the country, from the USA, who are utilizing ChatGPT. Put, actually around the world, because Mahabali has a piece in here. They put different um, ideas up, For and there are a hundred of them, okay? And you can download the entire book. It's real, it came out in 2023, of course, <laughs> just a few months ago, and they keep updating it. So this 1.2 is available now as of July. And so what they do is they have people put their ideas up, their tools they use, what they're hoping to achieve, the context, where they got the inspiration for doing the, uh, that particular idea, um, uh, contact details if you want to talk to the person, the author, the organization they work for. So here's someone from Adelaide, uh, Australia, great place down in Adelaide from uh, Scotch College, um, which I didn't get to when I was in Adelaide, talked about using AI tools kind of as a, as a helper for an entrepreneurial startup project in their classes, maybe helping with marketing plans and prototyping, right? Uh, and getting students to just, just in time support as they're designing um, action plans, business plans for companies and so forth. Another professor um, talks about how to use, utilize ChatGPT 
to create scenarios, create cases, create problems uh, that you might rewrite. So authoring cases does take a lot of time. I know my friend Mark Braun here at Indiana University takes a few hours. I think he said maybe it's actually five to seven hours to create a, 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 anatomy cases that his first year medical students go through. If you can have ChatGPT create some text content and some visuals that might supplement it, you might be able to design those case scenarios in a more quick fashion and bring the, the learner into the real world of nursing or um, a pre-med and so forth. Uh, inter interviewing learner personas. Here, utilizing ChatGPT to create and then impersonate a persona <laughs> created by the student. The student then interviews the persona about the topic of their project as a way to iteratively refine and improve and think about alternative points of view. This professor's at the University of Massachusetts at Boston. Using ChatGPT for peer assessment. So in, in effect, having it be that outside other. Um, here's someone at the OpenU in the UK uh, utilizing ChatGPT just for that purpose, that benefit of peer assessment. Deepening students' learning experience by evaluating work against certain criteria. Um, and so they get cheap, quick kinds of advice. And then and they can feel maybe um, more secure and, and, and they're not so embarrassed with their first drafts or with their initial ideas because it's a non-human partner. Again, having it as a debate partner has been mentioned over and over and over again. Uh, here's someone who's again at the Open University uh, Catherine Jewett, I don't know her. Um, I've used it as a debate process with students to encourage active learning and active listening, increasing critical thinking. Student feedback showed they have been to have found debating to be a useful way to explore and improve their knowledge on a topic. And you can read more on each of these. Again, this is downloadable for free. Using Dolly to enhance student understanding of terms and concepts by creating an image in a couple of seconds and generating that for students to reflect upon and improve their work or maybe embed within their papers and their, improve their conceptual understanding, having a visual as well as text. And this is one I'm using in my classes that's being utilized by Naryari Kash, I, I shouldn't even started on that one, in Surrey uh, in the UK, a lecturer in learning development. She's having AI generated book summaries and as Chris, Kirsten knows, who's in my class, or Kristen knows, I'm doing that this semester. Students can have ChatGPT create a book summary and then reflect on it, improve it, um, and so forth, and turn that in to me. Um, I want to show that while AI can generate comprehensive book summaries and chapters, it's important to remember these tools are not perfect. I'm going to come back to that. They're, they're not perfect. They're kind of bland and boring and so forth, but it's again, starter kinds of text. Um, I think this is the last one in this section, empowering student-led study discussions, study questions, ChatGPT generated prompts to get the discussion started. So every week I have a moderator, I have a someone who st signs up to start discussion and wrap discussion. ChatGPT can do that as well and be, be a second moderator, second, second um, starter and it maybe chat PDF. If you've not seen ch chat PDF, I really like that better than chat GBT, but you're limited to 100, 100 pages of text for free. You can put in your uh, PDFs of the articles you're reading every week, put them into chat PDF and have it generate questions on those articles. So you can come to class with a whole set of questions on your own articles that you might've written or other people's articles, probably more likely. So as I said, I'm studying language learning online with some brilliant people. I've got great a great team um, who wanted to study this. This is not my idea. Um, we're interviewing YouTubers who are using ChatGPT to teach languages, to you know the grammar issues, definitions, uh, quizzes, and so forth. Um, it's, it's phenomenal. And, and one of the top languages being taught is Japanese. Um, of course, Chinese and English and Spanish and other languages. Um, as I said, we've got four studies already since six months ago that two are published, two are in review. So conversational partners, ChatGPT can engage students in interactive conversations, allowing them to practice their dialogue. Grammar and syntax cor correction, providing explanations for those corrections. Just simple writing practice and feedback. 
reading comprehension. Teachers can use ChatGPT to create reading comprehension exercises. And there are a few more. Pronunciation, ChatGPT is text-based. It can still provide phonetic uh, transcriptions and explanations of pronunciation rules. At this point, it'll improve. Cultural context, you get to understand better the idioms and customs of a particular language and culture. And then personalizing, creating a self-study plan, um, asking questions about particular areas that they wanna practice and learn more. So from a language learning uh, potential, you can understand the meaning of words in different contexts, can understand the common language mistakes, can understand um, writing for different genres, and it can also develop assessments, quizzes, and other kinds of things, and offer you definitions of words as, as, such as, um, uh, can you help me understand dis what dyslexia means in the following magazine? Can you help me explain it? Can you help me understand what dyslexia uh, means and uh, translate this into Chinese or into Spanish? Can you help me with grammatical mistakes in the following sentences? All sorts of things ChatGPT can help with so you can learn a language better. Now, again, I mentioned this will be framed, this talk will be framed, but we're at 1030 um, from the standpoint of two different um, models or frameworks of mine, my R2D2 framework and my tech variety framework which I've presented on for chat cheap for, for Contact North before. There are two free books now. Uh, the first one on the left there, Adding Tech Variety, you can download in Chinese or in English. Um, it's got 101 activities for tone, or encouragement, variety, autonomy, relevance, and so forth. That hundreds of thousands of people do so. Recently, the Commonwealth of Learning has created a second book. I'm not sure if John Drun realizes this. This is a new book from Sanjay Mishra and his friends there at the Commonwealth of Learning in Vancouver. Um, it's a thinner book. It's a more current book. It came out a year ago, um, and it's got a free class behind it on how to motivate and support learners online. So if you're trying to help your instructors become um, more become more effective in teaching online, there's a free class and two free books that you might offer them there. The first principle of the 10 principles of tech variety is tone or climate, right? And so we're having, in my class, we have guests every week. And in my class, I try to give them certain questions that we might ask them when they come into the class. So I might put their articles that they're reading into chat PDF or chat GPT and ask it to generate some questions. And I'll send that to the guests as possible questions that we might have. I might put that in the discussion forum for students to debate on before the guest comes in so they can debate the person's ideas. And then we bring them live through Zoom or other technologies. And oftentimes students will critique an idea about that scholar. And when we bring them in live, they'll be agreeing with them. They'll be totally disagreeing in the asynchronous and then in the synchronous like, Wow, it's a totally different environment. But this is creating a tone, a, a safe climate because they know the questions that they're gonna be asked when they come in. You can also have ChatGPT and other generative AI tools develop polling questions. I did not do that here. I did not develop these polling questions that Sarah had up earlier, but you could do that. You could utilize that. You can also use it for number two. ChatGPT be good for encouragement or feedback or creating quizzes or lesson plans or exams that can help students kind of like self-test. So they, they know that they know the content when they go to the real exam. So we might be able to create a whole suite of um, self-testing um, quizzes for your students throughout the semester so they feel more comfortable with the class when they come to the lectures or when they take the midterm and finalist exams. You can also create review material, study schedules, tailoring the study schedule for your students, summarizing key points, generating practical questions, um, even providing helpful tips on making study not only easier, but more effective and more efficient. This is in cyber news, as you notice there. And, and the number one quiz engine in the world called Quizlet has developed an AI tool they call QChat, which helps create corrective feedback, um, recognizes grammatical errors and gives examples on how to correct those, might create story prompts, other things. I've not used 
QChat. I've only been aware of QChat, but I went to FLT, that free magazine for language learning, and found a number of people were utilizing it. This professor in Johannesburg, South Africa, is utilizing ChatGPT to have his students translate contents to English to help them improve their conversation and their writing. So he teaches students who mostly don't know English outside the classroom. And they're they're worried about their English. They're they're tense, they're nervous about their mastery of English. So they're utilizing ChatGPT as an assistant or an aid in that in endeavor. <clears throat> Number three, curiosity and intrigue and unknowns. As I mentioned, there is a plugin tool to create transcripts of YouTube videos that you can insert into ChatGPT and have it generate a whole suite of questions or comparisons and contrasts and other kinds of things to get the students curious about that YouTube video, maybe make them more interested in watching it and then in turn reflecting on it. Um, in Daniel Stan Stanford's Substack, one of his 25 ideas was having critiquing, critiquing AI generated content. Example, should governments provide tax credits for electronic vehicles? Um, paste the AI response into your document in Word and then revise it, critique it, do something with it, or create another prompt out there. And so this is, this is the response that they got. So you could take this response and um, add your own comments to it, critique it, and so forth. But you could also refine the prompt. Pretend that you work for a nonprofit. Write a 400 word article in support of federal and state level income tax credits for electronic vehicles. Cite specific studies that show electronic vehicles, um, CO2 emissions, smog, and other pollutants. Mention the annual cost of asthma related other kinds of things. And here's what ChatGPT spit out. Again, you can take that as starter text. You can take that as uh, something you might want to critique or just compare it to the previous version and see how the types of prompts you used, prompt engineering, um, uh, resulted in different types of text. Number four, variety and novelty. Having um, Dolly and other generative AI tools <clears throat> add in images to a scene and then write reflective stories. So this might be more K-12 than higher ed, but reflections on how the scene changed. Have it be a starter prompt for imagination, your imagination skills. Autonomy and choice. Supplemental language learning also. So I'm also doing research on Duolingo. I've got two studies published this past year. If you're interested in any of this, write to me. Um, most of mine are in publication share if they're open access. If they're not open access, you'll have to write to me. But we're studying why, how and why people are using Duolingo to learn languages and how they're self-directing their learning. It's amazing. Again, a lot of people learning Japanese online, uh, but it's an AI tool as well as ChatGPT and ChatPDF and other ones out there. And if you're teaching languages online, you might have students utilize other supplemental tools to learn a language, in particular those that are AI-based like Duolingo. I've got what's called Be Brave options in my syllabus, in my courses. So be brave. One or two, three of my students were brave this past week and turned in a ChatPDF or ChatGPT assignment and then a critique on it. Have chat PDF for ChatGPT or other generative AI tool generate a 2,000, 3,000 word summary of a scholar, and then write a two to three page reflection paper review critique of that scholar, incorporating quotes that ChatGPT included. Be brave. Have put a PDF of a book into chat PDF or other generative AI tools, and then have it critique, have it do a critique, have it do a book review and then write a reflection on that, a mini glossary of definitions, maybe have it create and then rewrite those definitions, those terms, maybe have it create charts or whatever. Be brave. I'm teaching learning environment design. So, you know, feel free to utilize ChatGPT. I told my students to generate starter text, including a few quotes for their final papers, not writing the whole paper as Rachel knows, but maybe a few quotes that leads them into their final papers. That I'm gonna grade tomorrow, Rachel. <laughs> Number six, discuss ethical issues. So here's a professor, Autumn Keynes at University of Michigan at Dearborn, who's asking her students ethics issues and questions. Robotics, maybe not coming for your jobs today or tomorrow, but maybe next year or the year after. Is it okay to ask students to help train the very thing that might 
take opportunities away from them in the future. Have them reflect on that. Make it meaningful to their life. Make it relevant to your students. What are issues in your student's life that you could be utilizing ChatGPT for? There is a popular book. I actually commissioned someone to write a book review of this book, Machines of Loving Grace by John Markoff, the New York Times. Great book of the history, basically, of technology on planet Earth. Um, but here's a professor who's utilizing it, uh, Kevin McCutcheon from University of New York, State University of New York at Plattsville. Students work in groups to outline and summarize the first three chapters of the book. Then he shows them what ChatGPT produced. And the comparison was, was striking because ChatGPT was basically a laundry list of events in a timeline. It wasn't it wasn't that thoughtful, that provocative at all. They, the students found it soulless, soulless. It had false information, had wrong names attached to things. So it didn't, wasn't doing perfect as you might have expected. So here's a really great chance for student discussion, debate, reflection, meta-reflection on the benefits of AI in education and to do uh, metacognitive um, types of activities on this, um, on these products, on the student work and on the AI work. Sure. Text revision. Uh, we're at yep. 1040. Thank you. Text revisions. Um, Daniel Stafford Substack again. Um, he asked students for, for activities where students revise and critique AI generated text. Consider how students will annotate their work. For example, here's some guidelines. If at least 50% of the sentence was AI generated, he wants them to highlight that sentence in yellow. Track changes when they revise the AI generated text. So the AI text stands out and the revised version is shown in a different color. Identify at least one place where AI generated text is problematic and highlight maybe that text in another color. So he's having students interrogate that text, pick it apart and rewrite it and expand it and so forth. Do something with it. Don't let it be a one-off activity. Come back to it, change it, maybe discuss it, and then do something more with it. Again, Daniel Stanford's substack. Summarize a text. Summarize the most important points of an article or a book or a, a thematic issue of a, a, a particular special issue of a journal. Come up with bullet points. Limit the summary to a maximum 200 words, he says. Then take the following outline and expand on it flesh out those paragraphs. So again, it's starter fodder for your brain, for your brain to start working. So it's not so squishy, right? Okay, get that brain to working. Um, ChatGPT is a tool or thought partner. My former doc student, when I was back in ed psych at Indiana, educational psychology, Ron Baghetto was one of my teaching assistants, or we called AIs. He's now a professor at Arizona State, and he's a great creative guy. He studies creativity. He's created... Um, tools, a collection of creativity focused chatbots that his students then use to um, discuss with and have um, activities wrapped around, deliberately challenging their assumptions. Students, in fact, one student got his dissertation idea from talking to this creativity focused chatbot. It was great, great idea. Good job, Ron. So Ron was featured in Nature last week. That's why I put this up there. Um, so this is the article I mentioned earlier from Nature about, well, ChatGPT has entered the classroom. How might we use these to transform education? How might we? We should be. We will be. We are transforming. Look at the number of ideas you guys had up already. You are doing this. My friend Helen Crompton was also featured in OpenAI's blog. She's a professor at Old Dominion, and she's using ChatGPT as debate partners who will point out weaknesses in their ar arguments, who might be a recruiter interviewing them for a job who might play on the, the role of a new boss who might deliver feedback in a specific way, to get students to react to different personalities so that they're more able to um, uh, quickly adapt to a new working environment, potentially. That's number seven, interactive and collaborative. Number six was relevancy. Number eight is engagement. So Daniel Stanford's substack again, write a scene in a movie script where people in specific professions interact a doctor, a nurse, a pilot, a flight attendant. Then have students, so looking for AI bias, analyzing AI bias. What gender did AI assign to each role? How did this reinforce or contradict a common stereotype? Analyze how AI handles the racial or gender representation. 
It might change depending upon how you worded it. And they have examples. So if you look at this, is there any bias in here? Can someone pick out the bias that AI picked for the nurse and the doctor and the pilot and the professor and diversity? Put in the chat window what you see happening here. Okay. I'm curious what people have. Ah, it looks. Uh, da, 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 da. They're all males, right? Okay, Francine, thank you. Yeah, most of the most of the ones who are doctors are going to be males out there. Implicit bias. Thank you, Chelsea. Okay. So yeah, so a lot of things interesting there, and in what it picked out. I'll go to the next one here. Any bias in this one? Okay, following images were generated by Daniel Saffer using Dolly. Okay, the prompt is illustration of a nurse, a doctor, a pilot, and a professor with diverse racial representation. Okay. Any bias here? Laura Lee, Francine. Okay. So you can think about how students might be thinking about the bias in different representations, right? So number nine, tension or challenge. My friend Paul Kim has designed a tool called Smile. Smile. Stanford Mobile Inquiry Learning Environments, where it can evaluate five levels of questionings that students might have. He's been utilizing this around the world. He's gone to Thailand, he's gone to Rwanda, he's gone to India, worked with blind children. He's having kids increase their literacy skills by utilizing this tool to ask deeper types of, uh, types of questions. But it's also being used in higher education, K-12 and higher ed around the world. And it's backed up by ChatGPT or an AI engine, which has millions of questions in the database. Smiles connected to ChatGPT to give feedback and guidance on the levels of questions they're asking. My friend Trent Fong from Cal, uh, Cal State Fresno, or Fresno State University, I should say, has students reflect on the questions that they're gonna ask, uh, and then reflect on the authenticity, accuracy, trustworthiness, ethical and moral nature of the responses that ChatGPT gives them and records the levels of questions that students are asking. Then she has students generate 50 or more questions and write reflection reports on the depth and breadth of the responses that ChatGPT provides, okay? So it gives constructive feedback on the questions. Students, uh, it will rank the questions from one to five, most basic to most critical, and then students get in competitions. Sometimes competition is good to get students to generate those ideas. I utilized it last night. I said, okay, I've been reading books on North Korea recently, a few on South Korean adoption books. My son's adopted from Korea. I'm really interested in things there. So I said, what, what will it take for North and Korea um, to be North and South Korea to be reunified? What level of question? Great job. It's a level five question. It involves speculation, uncertainty about the future. Reunification of the South is complex and sensitive. It's got diplomatic issues, trust building measures, security concerns, and so forth. So you can download Smile for free and utilize it in your classes. Uh, and so another professor is using ChatGPT as a co-pilot, right? Normalizing citing of AI, just like normalizing citing of Wikipedia was 15 or so years ago, or 20 years ago, actually. ChatGPT can be a student co-pilot, letting them brainstorm and improve their phrasing and helping learn new concepts. Anna Mills from City College in San Francisco teaches critical AI literacy. And she recommends student clearly labeling any portion, portion of assignment generated by ChatGPT or another source, just like they would cite other sources, other references. Grace Hennix, a professor or lecturer at, in English at Texas A&M, um, she has it support job applications and resumes and utilizes it in her um, literature courses. But students have been underwhelmed, she says. She found that chatbot actually created more work for students because it created repetitive application letters, didn't have much personality in it. It just generated, spit it out context. Remember the five, five paragraph essay, just as Bereiter and Scardamalia would say at the University of Toronto, just knowledge telling. It's not transforming it something into some coherent kinds of text. Um, so yeah, it, it might not improve things, but it gives students pause to reflect on what it did produce. And then finally, Autumn Keynes at University of Michigan Dearborn has students' um, final projects um, do technical, ethical, ethical, techno ethical audits. 
and it has ChatGPT help them in the audits that they're producing or their final projects in the class. So that's the tech variety model. I'll briefly go through the R2T2 model in five minutes, and then we'll do five minutes of Q&A at the end. But you might wanna you know, think about downloading the book or utilizing the new book, which is available at the Commonwealth of Learning. Again, if you go to my homepage, you can click on download both of these right now. They're, all, they're linked there. Um, this book is not free, unfortunately. Read, reflect, display, and do, R2, D2. Um, it's not necessarily a learning style model. It's a way to think about diverse learners that we might have in our classroom. Uh, part one, words, spoken words, written expressions. Again, using ChatGPT, input my article on the trail of self-directed online learners that came out uh, online first earlier this year. Input that in there and generate questions on it to, to utilize in your class with your students any kind of starter questions, any PDF or any Word document and have ChatGPT or ChatPDF generate questions around it. Text, all text, observation, review, reflect, watch. So there's lots of discussion and debate and, and plenary sessions at conferences out there. Um, webinars like this or summits. How about utilizing some of those videos that exist out there, incorporating them in your class and having students reflect on what the experts are saying. Have them do a meta reflection. Or them think about the, the credibility of the sources that ChatGPT has provided within the context that's been generated as this high school teacher in computer science in India is doing at the American International School in Chennai. This professor at Lafayette College is utilizing that jet, text gen ed book I mentioned earlier. And it's having he's having his undergraduate students translate a complex policy document into plain English and then comparing it to what ChatGPT uh, produced and looking at the difference in meaning between the, the, the LMM model, the output, and what they've produced. So something that you all could, do, could be doing, comparison kinds of things. This professor who's in Missouri, University of Missouri at Kansas City has his undergraduate students utilizing ChatGPT and generative AI to assist in revising their essays and asking it uh, the LLMs to respond to common peer review prompts. This assignment can be used and adapted in most disciplines and courses um, from you know, advanced courses to beginning kinds of courses. Nupar Ranadi from George Mason University asked students to generate a complex essay using AI text generation tool and then edit that text using the readability tools that she's been teaching them, utilizing techniques that she's been teaching in her class. Students are asked to share their final output along with visuals that demonstrate a comparison between the various versions of the generated content. She's using it with first year writing and professional writing classrooms. How can AI make credible contributions to the writing and editing process? At Delaware State University, Bushan Aral and Ordnar Taylor have a four-week assignment where students engage in extended conversations with a chatbot and you know, then write a paper about those conversations, write a report or do an oral presentation about what they've learned from that uh, four-week interactions with a bot and immersing them in that bot world. And finally, from North Carolina State, Paul Fife has his students use um, uh, language learning, accessible language model to rewrite their term papers with the goal of fooling the instructor. The goal is to try and turn in something that would the instructor would think they wrote. And the assignment makes them confront um, issues and reflect on unexpected difficulties, ethical dimensions, collaboration issues, and so forth. So they start with, hey, try and, try and use it. D do use it. See if it, it produces just as good a work as what you would have produced. And then when it doesn't, having them rewrite it and discuss what, what was flawed in those documents and so forth. Visual learners, you might, again, utilize these conferences. There are tons of them and summits and webinars like this. And, and, and also short demonstration videos where students are showing how to use ChatGPT for language learning, like what I've been doing in my research, and utilizing those for students to in turn have discussions wrapped around the existing video content that it might exist in YouTube or podcast shows. 
NPR specials and other kinds of things. Um, so having students discuss and debate and images online that maybe Dolly has produced and you know other, and free images that have been produced by ChatGPT and generative AI that are on display. Finally, kinesthetic kinds of learners getting students in role play and dramas and simulations and so forth, producing final projects. We've already mentioned a number of them. Um, there's a final example of how Dolly might be used to generate uh, images of idioms and proverbs and then write papers and reflections and so forth on that. Having Dolly to generate culturally specific images and have students research and explain why an image does or doesn't fit the culture and so forth. What's next? We're gonna have advances in AI voice any mode of sounds, whether it's hearing someone who's sad or excited or hopeful or terrified and having professional actors and actresses voices in those AI tools. We've got a couple of closing questions here. Um, Sarah can put up number four. How many ideas did you get from this session for utilizing ChatGPT or generative AI in your teaching, training or tutoring or translating? I don't know if Sarah can find that number four, Sarah? Yep, I am just launching it right now. There we go. Thank you. There you go. Hopefully you got a oh, great. None is in the lead. All right. Uh, <laughs> one or two, three to five, six to 10, more than 10. We've got 79 of you finishing this out of 148 are still with us. We have more than half people are still with us. 87 have finished it. We get up to 100. I'll, we'll stop the poll here at 88, 89, 90, 91, 92. Four more have to take it, 95. We're just about ready to end the poll. Three more, three more, two more, two more. There we go. So we end the poll and we'll share those results with all of you. So 2% still didn't get something. If you didn't get something, Come back on February 8th and maybe I'll be better next time you get some ideas or don't come back. 21% of you at least got an idea. A one idea, two ideas, a three, 35, six to 10, 21, and more than 10, one five of you. So great. We've got another question, I think up here. And so if we go to number five, how many ideas did you get from this session for using ChatGPT or generative AI in your learning? In your learning, not in your teaching, your formal and informal learning. Okay, we've got 65, 67, 70, 73. 90, 91, 92, get a few more. Please, eight more, seven more, seven, six, six. Do I hear five? Do I hear four? Okay, four more, four more, four more, four more, two more, two more, one more, one more, one more. Okay, we're gonna end that poll now and we'll share the results here. 4% in terms of learning didn't get something for their learning, but one, uh, 36%, one in three of you got an idea for your learning. More of you have noticed got more ideas for teaching. Of course, that's the theme for today than for your own learning. Okay, we're gonna stop sharing there and we'll go on to the next slide. Uh, we we'll do that. So now I am going to need your help and um, I'll need to stop sharing this and share again by optimizing sound. And on the count of three, I cannot change and transform education by myself. It's going to take all of you. I cannot do this alone. So I'm going to need all of you to repeat with me. Unmute your microphones and say, I cannot do this alone. On the count of three. One, two, three. I cannot, I cannot do this alone. One, two, three. I cannot do, I cannot this, do alone. this alone. One, two, three. I cannot, do, I this cannot alone. do this alone. It's going to take all of you to change the world. And I'm glad that we had so many people sign up for this session and attend. You can get my free book right now, Motivation and Supporting Online Learners, Adding Some Tech Variety in my new research book, a new issue of Online Learning Journal, Systematic Reviews of the Research in Online Learning Free. Again, go to my homepage and download them today, trainingshare.com for my slides, or go back to the Contact North website. My email is listed there. That's my first dry run through this talk. I hope you got a few ideas and so forth. And if you don't 
write my email down quickly enough, just ask Sarah what it is. She'll put it in the chat window for you all, I think. Question yep, I can me. Do that. Sarah, do we have a question there? We do have a few questions in the um the Q and A tool. Um, I'm just hey, he Jung Ann. Good to see you here, and Amy Dillon, Elaine saying, "Oh, everyone's here today." I'm sorry. Go ahead, Sarah. That's okay. So we have a question from Mark. Um, so this is a while back. You said we're at 22 minutes in, and some people might already be feeling overwhelmed by the number of ways this technology can be used to enhance teaching and learning. At the same time, the technology itself is improving at an incredible rate. How can an educator hope to keep up with all of this, not just within an educational pedagogical perspective, but also within their own knowledge content area? Interested to hear ideas. Thank you, Mark Kircher from uh, Pampery, Finland, and I hope to visit sometime soon. It's great to have you with us. Uh, number one is talk to your colleagues. When you talk, you start explaining your ideas and they start getting more ingrained and you start getting some elaboration. So number one, if you stop and talk and get some feedback from them, from your colleagues or from your students, you start solidifying the several ideas that you have in your brain to start with, or focus on one or two of these special issues that I mentioned. You don't have to download all of them. Those, just one article from the, from a couple of these people that have 25 ideas, just focus on that. Just read one of these articles, two of these articles. There's plenty to get started with. You only need one or two new things every semester. You don't need hundreds of ideas, right, right away. And third way is start writing about it, publishing on what you're doing. That will help you refine your ideas and get commitment and dedication for um, and insight for the particular activities and pedagogies that you've tried out that can be shared with others. I found that in the early days of e-learning, I wrote an article on 10 ways to use do critical thinking, 10 for creative thinking, 10 for collaboration back in 1997. That helped me teach online. That one article I wrote gave me a framework I could utilize for all the courses I created for more than a decade. So write one article and reflect and then go back to that. Oh, what did I say in that article? Just, just hone in on that. Don't let all this periphery stuff that everyone, every day, your deans will be coming, your colleagues will have different ideas. Just hone in on one or two different things. Another idea, Sarah, another question, Sarah. Okay, one from Corey. Faculty in my institution are concerned about being able to cope with the increase in time and resource with um, changing their assessment model will require with the advent of chat GDP and similar. Do you think the standard summative assessment essay um, sorry, assessment essay will have to be ditched and become a more iterative, reflective, individual assessment model um, with more tutor contact time devoted to discursive exercise rather than chalk and talk lectures in order to still be a valid way to achieve learning outcomes. Nothing should be ditched. Nothing should be ditched, but we should experiment and pilot with alternatives one or two in the semester and see how well it works and refine. If it doesn't work the first time, refine it a second time and see whether or not it, it improves things. Maybe not a third time, but don't give up on an idea initially that you have. Um, try it out in a couple of different ways and then reflect on it. Reflect, remember R2D2, read, reflect, display, and do. Reflect's the most important point. But I, I wouldn't give up on things. I, I remodel things. I tweak things initially. That being said, <laughs> for the courageous out there, who want, and I'm doing it this semester myself, I, I have a hundred page syllabus I call the monster syllabus. I'm ditching it. I'm throwing it away and creating something new. Um, not fully embracing AI, but it's an emerging learning technologies class. So there are times and moments in which you stop and say, time, it's time to ditch, it's time to get rid of. But I would not automatically get rid of the ways, approaches that you've utilized. But once in a while, you might do. And then talk to your colleagues about what you've changed it. Maybe get collaborate. The best way to ditch something is to collaborate with someone else in another section of the class. And the two of you combined can create. So like I created Wikibook. My students des designed Wikibooks about 15 years ago. And we changed the final assignments. The students created books that we actually read. But I had colleagues in other places that were utilizing these books. I was working with uh, Grace Lynn at the University of Houston and Mimi Lee and others and uh, from other from from China and Taiwan and other parts of the world, Malaysia, 
and we're gonna have multiple people were, were changing their curriculum. So it got me support by them adopting it. So don't do it as a lone ranger is my answer if you can avoid that. Thanks for all these resources, Mark and John. Thank you very much, yeah. Um, Sarah, do we have a, another question? Uh, we'll do one more quick one, more of a, a question and a comment that I saw in the um, the chat as well about making your books um, available in French. Is that a possibility? Yes. Just write to me and ask um, if you've got capabilities of, uh, translating to French, to Italian. Someone started on Italian a couple of years ago, never finished. Well, I'd love to get additional languages for sure. If you want to translate it to Aussie speak, you know that too, you know. Um, it's great to see Christy here in Chen Fen and so forth. I'll read one more question we got before this. Uh, Rachel asks, does Dr. Bonk have any predictions about the timing for the end of the hype cycle surrounding AI so that we can get sustained productivity instead of fear and non-evidence-based hype? I'm afraid, Rachel, that the hype cycle is gonna be reified over and over again for AI and education. Um, you know, there, there'll be a, a definite pause at some point, but other AI tools will emerge that will start doing things that we didn't think was possible. And then again, we'll enter into this panic mode. I mean, we always move from awareness to resistance, right? To understanding, to doing, to sharing, to advocacy. This is the cycle with all, with all technologies and AI will be no different in that regard. Um, but yet we, we're going through that cycle of awareness, resistance, understanding, but we've been stu stuck in the awareness resistance for many, aspects of online learning and e-learning for 25 years. It keeps, that hype cycle keeps coming back when it when happened with MOOCs, right? We came back to that same hype cycle. It's just e-learning. It's a different form of e-learning or online learning. We're going to have all these um, versions or ideas or tools related to AI. We'll have hype cycles for each one of them. I hate to end on a downer note, but I do think there are a lot of possibilities for all of us in teaching and creating more lively, more engaging, more collaborative, more rich, interactive spaces in our classrooms for students not to just learn within our classes and courses, but to come back to them and add to them the resources that John and Mark and others have been putting in the chat window. Those people can be coming back to your class who have finished and, and keep adding to, creating a, his, a shared history in effect um, for everyone to participate in, become contributors for. This AI space, a uh, teaching space, is one that's going to provide us with opportunities that we never fathomed before. And we have to read from folks like, like John Drun, who have been writing about it for the last decade, read his work, um, and, and get you thinking about what's possible out there. I want to thank again everyone for coming today. Thank all my visiting scholars and my students for coming here and my friends around the world, whether they be in Australia, New Zealand, um, uh, Philippines, Pakistan, or wherever. Thank you, Sarah, for inviting me in. Again, February 8th, I think, at 10 a.m., we'll try something. We'll give you some more ideas. Come back. Great. Thank you so much, Curtis. That's all the time we have for today. Always a pleasure having you. Uh, such an engaging, insightful webinar. Thanks for all the great takeaways and the uh, great practical tidbits that all the participants can use in their own practice. I can um, see by the comments that are uh, that have been going on in the side, a lot of great side participation and conversation. So thank everyone for, for being engaged with this webinar. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, if just in case you didn't catch it, um, I will post the recording once the session has processed. Um, you can find it on teachonline.ca. Um, just look for the webinars tab um, and uh, find on the webinars. It will uh, be in the past webinar. So one more click after that. But also the Zoom system will send it out in about 24 hours if you want to wait for that, if uh, it's a little too uh, confusing. Um, so our last webinar uh, for the season will be coming up 
in um, December, December 7th, we have uh, the on-ramp to micro-credentials at scale, tips and techniques for the acceleration lane. Um, that will be Dr. Arthur Thomas, who will be joining us. Um, he is the Director of Professional Acceleration and Micro-Credentials at the College of Professional Studies at Syracuse University. So thanks again, everyone. Thank you, Kurt. And uh, have a wonderful rest of your Monday. Bye, everyone. Bye.